like we're connected. All right. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of Afterlife Apologetics. You guys are in for a treat because we managed to do a quick turnaround this week. Steve and I were dedicated to try and catch you guys back up to where we should be, which is doing, oh, today. For those who missed, I think we did it. Was it Monday or Tuesday, Steve? We did the episode on uh, L and G. And um, today we're moving in to O, which is Otherworldly Journeys. For those who are new here, just a very quick recap for anybody who may be here for the first time. This channel is dedicated to discussing near-death and deathbed experiences and evaluating them as a form of evidence to determine which worldview they best come out in support of. And so this channel is dedicated to looking at all that and then kind of how that evidence leads us to then interact with arguments from those worldviews, whether they be apologetic arguments or... Just kind of any any kind of perspective, honestly, as well as even the emotional sometimes we'll, we'll journey into that. So today we're continuing our series working on the GLOVE acronym. We've done G, we've done L, and now we're moving into O. And this, these acron this acronym is a way for people to think about near-death and deathbed experiences, specifically near-death experiences. It's a way for them to think about it and understand five large pillars that need to be explained by any worldview in order to properly account for near-death experiences. And so we've done the G, we've done the L, we're going over the O today, which is otherworldly journeys. And without further ado, I will jump right in. And it's Steve, you know the drill as usual. If you have anything to say, of course, just interject and we'll we'll go from there. Well, let, let's remind them each week of G-L-O-V-E. Just tell basically what they are. You don't have to explain each, but... It kind of helps me to keep it in my mind if we actually sure. say each week what they are. Yeah, so G is God-focused, L is unconditional love, O is otherworldly journey, V is vivid, and E is ethical, ethical transformation Very good. specifically. So let's launch into O. Okay, so within, within near-death experiences, there's oftentimes a reporting of other worlds and we're gonna we're gonna detail out what that is today and as you guys know we like to go in depth on the stuff so it'll be a great chance for you guys to kind of hear out what we're what we're talking about so in the myriad of narratives coming recounting near-death experiences a common thread that emerges is the experience of journeying into an otherworldly realm a space that seems separate and distinct from our everyday life characterized by its unearthly quality a defining feature of this otherworldly realm encountered in NDEs is its overwhelming beauty, one that transcends human language and comprehension, from lush landscapes possessing vibrancy that surpasses earthly equivalents to ethereal architecture and radiant cities of light. Those who have had NDEs often grapple with articulating the full depth of this extraordinary beauty. They speak of colors more radiant than those visible in the physical world and of an environment that seems harmoniously alive, pulsating with light and love. Now, you guys will notice that those are all positive characteristics because this acronym is specifically focusing in on positive near-death experiences. And that's just due to the fact that we have a lot more data around positive near-death experiences. And just want to let the audience know there are, in fact, uh, distressing near-death experiences and the, and the realms that they describe are also otherworldly, but they don't match those positive descriptions that I just gave. This, Good clarification. This indescribability significantly sets apart the transcendent beauty of NDEs from dreams or hallucinations, which typically draw from our memories and, however strange, can generally be expressed in human terms. This stark difference raises an intriguing question. If our brains are solely responsible for producing these experiences, then why do they surpass our capacity to describe them? Or do they use features that are not present in our memory? These characteristic ineffability resonates with the mystical tradition in Christianity where the encounters with the divine often defy human articulation hinting at an experience that transcends our usual reality and challenges the limitations of our descriptive capabilities. The otherworldly realm is often depicted as a place of profound sense, or excuse me, of profound peace and serenity. Experiencers describe feelings of deep tranquility and a sense of, quote, being home. That is, that is oftentimes how it is described to them. I, it felt more home than, than here. This environment contrasts starkly 
with the hustle and the stress of earthly life suggesting a realm where peace is not merely the absence of conflict but an intrinsic quality almost kind of like standing in a um field that's just full of peace it, it's hard to describe that right like even now i struggle to just kind of articulate the difference there of like instead of saying it was a peaceful realm like you could go to a busy downtown street in new york and no one's fighting and be like yeah it was it was peaceful but you wouldn't necessarily describe it as a peace peaceful place i think that those are two different descriptions that that i'm i'm alluding to like how they would describe it does that make sense steve like how they would kind of describe a yes. realm that okay cool Right. A part of the ineffability might be that the even the buildings themselves and the plants themselves exude things like love, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't think of a mixing of things like that in our own dreams or, or, or in our own imaginations. Communication within this otherworldly realm also seems to transcend earthly norms. Individuals recount instances of telepathic communication where thoughts and feelings are exchanged directly without the need for spoken words. This method of communication provides clarity and understanding, enabling a deeper level of connection between entities. So before I start um, listing off some of these differences here, one thing I want to note to, to the audience is you guys are kind of like, okay, whatever, people are having visions and they're crazy and they're different. What, what we really want to hammer home here is a few things. When people have hallucinations or people have visions People come away from those experiences understanding that what they had was in fact a hallucination and a vision. And even more so, as time progresses, it becomes more obvious that that experience was a vision or a hallucination. Whereas with near-death experiences, these instances specifically, people don't change their positions on these experiences, even after 20 years. That is an incredible statistic to look at when you when you kind of compare and contrast them additionally you guys will note that we were referring to these realms pulling information um brand, brand new information so what i mean by brand new information is if you're having a hallucination or a vision you're either going to use the environment that's around you or environments you have been in previously so your mind's not going to invent new data new new places not like you're not going to have vibrant new cities or anything like that and again, you could be like, well, I took, you know, I took mushrooms one time and this and that happened. And it's like, okay, fair enough. But after you left the experience, you understood that it was mushrooms generating this experience. It wasn't, it wasn't a solely, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. I guess um, maybe the word would be like an, a homogenous experience in the sense that there was no additives to the near-death experience to cause these things to, to occur. It's just simply attributed to the fact that they died and were outside of themselves and they experienced a new place, a new realm, which they come back to and say, that was a different place. And so I really want to stress this, that people have a genuine sense of that was somewhere different. That was somewhere different than where I'm at now. And I think it's really important, really important to focus in on that characteristic of near-death experiences because if these people are to be believed on mass, which there's a lot of them and there's a lot of good evidence, then what they're telling us is that I am genuinely going to a different place than where we are at now. And again, that means a worldview needs to properly account for a realm outside of the realm that we live in now. So something beyond a metaphysical realm. Okay. And so that's where a worldview needs to be strong enough to kind of account for this metaphysical reality that these people seem to be going to and visiting outside of their physical bodies. Okay. Uh, so we discussed kind of that general intro there and now communication real quickly on this. Oftentimes people describe it being a telepathic form of communication in near death experiences. So instead of using malice to speak, it's more like, um, your thoughts and as it says your thoughts and your emotions are directly transmuted to another person and they are able to receive and understand that directly again that very unique quality to this realm interestingly time and space constraints in our field in our physical world are reported as fluid and mutable in this realm and what 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 i mean by that is 
time and space are often reported as almost, uh, I guess the best word here would be suspended. Like they're, they're, not, they're not actually working the way they should. It could be very fast, very slow. It's just perceptions of time are completely and utterly changed. NDE survivors often find it difficult to delineate the sequence of events with some describing the experience as if everything happened at once and others feeling as, as, it, as if time had ceased to exist. Similarly, movement within this realm doesn't seem to obey physical laws, instantaneous travel by thought, and the ability to be in multiple places at once are some of the intriguing characteristics frequently reported. Now, I'm more interested in the time piece in terms of you know, we're kind of building these arguments on top of one another, right? It's like, I don't want to take this idea that time is being suspended into a vacuum. What I want to do is I want to say, okay, near-death experiences have good evidence. Okay, great. Now let's look at the great sequence of reports and from those generate a general experience. And then in these general experiences, there's this suspension of time that's often and very characteristically reported to follow the the description i gave you guys which is um everything happened at once and time ceased to exist and so the the then i would put to you okay cool so we've built up to this point and my question to you is what worldview tells us that time and space itself was created and that when we cease to exist in this time and space because we understand that time and space is interconnected and we know this through scientific discoveries as well when we when we die and we leave this it would seem that the observation of time is suspended would mean that we are dying and transitioning outside of that time realm so again it alludes to this metaphysical reality that holds our reality up and in place. And so when people are visiting out to it, again, it's otherworldly. And therefore we need an, a worldview that can properly explain time being suspended in this, in this capacity. So why do I bring all this up is to say worldviews that want to posit basically creation events happening inside this timeline. I don't think they can account for these characteristics at all because Clearly, there's there seems to be a realm outside of time and space that, as we know it, that these people are going to. Now, in the Christian worldview, we would simply say God exists outside of time and space. God is eternal. And so when we die, we are in his presence or in his realm. And therefore, it would make sense that his realm would also be eternal. Um, not, not, not eternal. What am I trying to say here, Steve? It would be outside of time and space itself. It wouldn't be eternal as God would have obviously created it at some point, I would think. But um, does that make These sense? These are high matters that are hard to explain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, but a little background would be helpful. I think uh, many people have always assumed that time and space had to always be with us. I think that uh, scientists up through the 1800s, many of them, especially the secular ones, would say, hey, the universe has just always existed. Then when you came up with the Big Bang, the interesting thing about that is all of a sudden, and with um, uh, with Einstein, number one, time became relative, right? And so it relative to how fast you were going or whatever, that time was not something that was always consistent for everybody. But secondly, when you got into the Big Bang, even as Richard Dawkins, the atheist, says in his book, um, the God delusion, he'll say that the, 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 um, the theory today of the Big Bang is that the universe, everything that exists out here, the universe, including time and space, came into being during the Big Bang. Now, that to me confirms a lot about Christian theology, which would say, okay, then something outside of time and space had to have started this universe, or else you have to say that something came out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And if there was something before then, where was it if there was no space? When was it if there was no time? The only thing I can conceive of outside of space and time would be God. And so now those concepts, to me, make sense in today's science, and it makes even more sense within the Christian worldview that, oh, when people go to the other side of the afterlife— perhaps there's this sense of lack of time and space, or at least it's different over there. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. That, that was great context. And and that's kind of like Steve's filling in the gaps there of the argument that I was making. And, and I appreciate that, which is to say that we know that time and space had a beginning. So therefore 
whatever began time and space would therefore have to be timeless, eternal, and immaterial. And so with this timeless and immaterial realm that these people seem to be visiting, then again, it harkens back to what worldview properly accounts for this characteristic of near-death experiences most commonly uh, encountered, or not, not most commonly encountered, but often encountered enough to fit into the five pillars here. So lastly, many near-death experiences recount encounters with spiritual beings or deceased loved ones. These encounters are characterized by profound wisdom, understanding, and compassionate interactions. Whether being greeted by loved ones or engaging in profound dialogues with luminous beings, these interactions seem to play a crucial role in the otherworldly journey. In summary, the otherworldly realm experienced in NDEs, as described by the experiencers themselves, is an environment of unparalleled beauty, deep peace, enhanced communication, non-linear time and space, and encounters with sentient entities. These unique characteristics contribute to the transformative impact these experiencers tend to have on individuals, radically reshaping their perceptions of life, death, and reality itself. I'd like to note that. Because notably when you ask them, you know, do you believe in a realm that exists beyond this realm? You phrase the question somewhere in that, that kind of lane then the answer that you're going to get is yes, a resounding yes. Commonly that they believe in a realm outside of this realm, like a heaven or a hell um, after these experiences. And so again, we need to have a worldview that can account for this. Okay. Uh, indeed, the way in which the otherworldly is often described in NDE narratives presents a challenge to non-theistic worldviews and even to some theistic ones that don't accommodate for such a realm. The consistency and vividness of these accounts suggests that these are not merely brain-generated hallucinations or recreations of earthly environments, but experiences of a transcendent reality. Now, let's delve into how this fits within Christianity and where other worldviews may fall short. So Christianity's concept of heaven is uniquely positioned to embrace the nature of the otherworldly described in NDEs. The New Testament depicts heaven as a realm distinct from our earthly existence, characterized by love, peace, and the presence of God. This portrayal corresponds exceptionally well with the vivid narratives of NDEs. Additionally, Christianity focuses on God's personal nature as a figure of profound love and grace, resonates with the deeply personal encounters with a divine figure reported in the NDEs. So, Christianity does a really, I think, great job of kind of giving us some hints at what this otherworldly realm looks like, acts like, feels like, to the point where when we we kind of start to, like if you were to take each religion and start listing out descriptions of the afterlife, descriptions of heaven, descriptions of hell, etc., and then you start kind of comparing and contrasting the descriptions you get from the NDEs and the descriptions you get within Christianity, you see, okay, there are some strong parallels here in between the descriptions we receive and the descriptions that uh, the Bible gives us, which would obviously be our, our documentation within Christianity to kind of understand. Now, a fascinating parallel can be drawn here with the biblical, biblical accounts that capture the ineffability of divine or heavenly experiences. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, refers to his experience with the third heaven as ineffable. For those who don't know, that is indescribable. It is beyond human description, and you guys can find that in 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4. Likewise, the prophet Ezekiel, in his first chapter, uses metaphorical language, almost as if he is searching for the right analogies to describe his vision. For example, Ezekiel 1.5 states, and within it there were figures resembling four living beings. The choice of words suggests the struggle to put the indescribable vision into words. The resonance of such ineffability with NDEs adds another layer of compatibility between these experiences and the Christian worldview. And so I think it's really important, and, and you can even see this in the book of Revelation, that when biblical writers are given a vision of heaven, they often come back using these kind of wild descriptions to kind of make sense of it. And I think that makes total sense to me from the perspective that if you saw a realm outside of the realm you're in, it's like 
you're a 2D man trying to describe a 3D world to everyone else. And so, of course, there's going to be dimensional aspects that you just simply have no words for, and you'll probably say some pretty wild stuff um, in, in your ability to try to describe it. Um, so what I really am interested in here is why these writers go to heaven and then Paul talks about it being ineffable, that he can't even utter the words. And then some of these Old Testament, um, when they visit, it's it's really challenging for them to find the words to describe this realm that they're seeing and the way that they describe God and his throne and his seat. It's It, it to me, matches up really well with near-death experiences in that they have they describe characteristics about God and his nature that you see resonate within the descriptions that we find within near death experiences versus other religions. For example, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Islam and the way they describe heaven. It just doesn't seem to match up with these characteristics that, that because I think the paradise that you find in Islam seems very different than the heaven that's of the new Testament, which seems a little odd to me. Um, cause you would think there would be a little more crossover there, but, but that's neither here nor there. I guess my point is this, that while Islam's concept of Jannah, um, they don't fully, they offer detailed visions of an otherworldly paradise. They don't fully align with NDEs in some key aspects. For instance, in the Islam tradition, there's a huge emphasis on final judgment day, which segregates the righteous and the wicked a concept not universally echoed in NDE accounts, which often highlight a sense of universal love and acceptance, and more notably this. Moreover, NDE narratives often diverge from some aspect of afterlife depictions in certain religions. For instance, Islamic paradise, as described in several hadiths, include physical indulgences such as virginal companions and bountiful feasts, elements that are seldom, if ever, reported in NDE narratives. Similarly, the... Um, Oh, I don't, I don't need to read that piece, but basically like the, some of the aspects that are often reported in Islam's description of heaven, when you look at these NDE accounts, you don't see any, if ever those aspects ever reported. And I think that that is a problem, especially when those, when those pieces seem to be rather central to this, this afterlife that. I mean, you would think there would be more accounts of if 5% of the world's population is having NDEs, I mean, 5% of that's going to be Muslims having those near-death experiences. And so how many Muslims are in the world? I think it's like a third of the population is, is Islamic. So it's like, that's going to be a lot of data to work with. And the fact that none of them are coming back and saying, hey, all the descriptions we've received of the Islamic heaven is true, or the Islamic paradise is true, I think that does raise a concern. Again, because if we look at this as witnesses going to the other side and then coming back and giving testimony as to what that other side contained and looked like, you would find it odd that none of them come back with a testimony that matches up, or virtually none of them come back with a testimony that matches up with this worldview and how it describes the other side. Whereas with Christianity, I think the power of it is it is specific yet vague enough to where it's specific enough to have these detailed attributes of God's characteristics, as well as the actual characteristics of the heavenly realm itself to a certain degree, but there's still enough vagueness there that it doesn't like put itself in a corner where it's like, where I think Islam does like, those are very specific characteristics to be talking about, like the 40 virgins, for example, whereas that, that when you don't find that in any of your new death experiences, now it's kind of like, well, what's up with that? Like how, how would they account for that? What I guess would be my question. Steve, oh, and, let me push here? back yeah. a little bit yeah. here. Let's say that the, uh, say that the Muslims saying, well, wait a minute. Now, you've said the same thing about Christianity that when I, when I say, okay, where is the God sitting on his throne judging you and doing all these things that we're expecting in the afterlife? We're saying, well, wait a minute. This is not really the afterlife. This is an intermediate period where mm -hmm. we're going to the other side. They might come back and say, well, when the Quran and the Hadiths talk about uh you know, all these virgins that you get on the other side if you've lived a, a, a righteous life, that, that's all stuff after you die. Now, if you're talking about a halftime experience here, obviously we're not going to be experiencing that. So they may say, hey, who knows what this interim period is like or when people just get a brief glimpse of the 
um, you know, entrance to heaven or, or something like that or a vestibule to heaven. Uh, so they might not see that as contradictory at all. Uh, how would you respond to that? I guess my question would be, within Christianity, there is an explanation as to why that difference is there already in our text of there is to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. And so right there within Christian theology is when you die, you go to a different realm and that realm is God's realm. And and, and more so specifically, that's the context of a, of a believer dying. But even in, even in these experiences, we're seeing people die who aren't believers, and they're going and experiencing this God. And then we can even understand it theologically that there will be a final judgment where the scrolls of time and space and everything, all of creation, will be wrapped up, and then there will be a final judgment. So we can see two different sequences of there's my death, and then there is a final judgment and time event happening here later down the road and that and that not just that's not just the end of my physical existence that's the end of physical existence as as we know it now so that's where creation that's where the new creation will come into play so again the christian theology has this clear clear cut place for it so i guess my question to the muslim would be where do, where's this delineation made within the islamic texts that there's this um temporarily temporary paradise existing now and then there's going to be some kind of like new paradise made after Allah comes back and judgment day happens. It's like, th I guess that would be my question. And, and Steve, I don't know if you have an answer for that. I'm just thinking as you're speaking, we're uh, thinking out loud here. I, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, in a near death experience, you do see people on the other side, deceased relatives, deceased friends, deceased people coming back. And you don't really see any of those coming back with a, uh, with a harem of, of virgins that are with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're not really seeing those aspects, which you might expect to see. Uh, I'm not sure if you would, but you might expect to see something like that if you were, if it were a, a Muslim other side. Another point is, which you've brought up, is the ineffability. It seems to me when you've got Ezekiel, Daniel, and uh, John's revelation, these are speaking of a lot of aspects that they see on the other side now as opposed to the future. I mean, Revelation has both in it, talking about the new heavens and new earth, but a lot of it is prior to that. And when they describe those, as you mentioned in Ezekiel, there's this sense of it was sort of like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. It was like this. And so I'm wondering if, when we say in biblical studies, both conservatives and liberals talk about apocalyptic literature, they'll say, well, a lot of this is not really very literal. It's more figurative because this they're writing in this form of apocalyptic literature. And it's tended to be said that this is like a special type of communication, as if you're writing fiction that's not really fiction or yeah, but it's sure it's something you know they were writing in a certain style but i'm wondering this is just speaking out loud a little exercise for young theologians and biblical scholars out there would it not be more appropriate to say since the bible never speaks of oh well this is a special kind of apocalyptic literature that's just something that we as scholars come up with maybe apocalyptic literature is really ineffable literature where people are seeing things on the other side that they have no correspondence with here in this life. So they have to speak in terms of it was like, yeah, this like a, a great mm. this or that, yeah. or it was a being I've never seen before, but kind of like this. So it's really ineffable. Whereas when you compare that to the Muslim scriptures, it seems like, and, and, and I'd have to go research this more thoroughly, the, uh, more thoroughly because I'm not an expert in this, but it would seem like it's very effable. I could imagine myself living among a group of virgins as a, um, a, a as some kind of reward for life. I could picture that. Yeah. But it, it seems like it's a very earthly realm on the other yeah. side in a spiritual sense, but it's very effable. And, and so, a scholar will have to check this out for us because I'd like to see the specifics. 
Whereas the Christian view of the other side is there's much that's simply ineffable because it's almost like a different dimension. We can't imagine being in a timeless state. We can't really imagine speaking mind to mind to one another. We can't imagine. It's not just that there are more vivid colors on the other side, but there are colors you've never seen on earth Mm. or the color blind have no experience or memory of colors, they go to the other side and they see all these range of colors. Or music. See blind people going to the other side. People blind from birth, a study was done on this, and they don't have any of these memories of 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 what things are like. They don't they don't even think in black because they don't know what black yeah, is. No There's just nothing there. And yet they go to the other side and report all these things that they actually see. Well that's things that are ineffable because they're outside of our experience, which seems to me different from the little I've seen in Muslim literature. Again, you'd need a scholar to go into their description yeah. of the afterlife. They seem very effable as opposed to ineffable. And I guess like that's that's the challenge of like I would really like to hear a Muslim apologist kind of present the case for this. But I think you make a great point, Steve, in that a lot of what you see within the Islamic tradition and some of these other traditions, it seems as if the afterlife is just almost, almost like a pinnacle of what could be achieved in this life, right? Versus within the Christian tradition, the afterlife is something that is so transcendent and different from, from here that we struggle to even have words to properly describe it. Whereas within Islam, it's, oh yeah, 40 virgins and bountiful feasts and happy times. So it's, I think that what you're, what you will kind of what you're saying and, and correct me if I'm wrong here is that Christianity says, you'll understand some parts of this afterlife, but a lot of it you won't have the words for because you won't have the experience for Whereas in these other religions, it seems almost very much like they thought of the most pinnacle possible experience they could have on this realm and then said, that's what heaven is. That's, that's, and I think like, not to rabbit trail a little, little too much here, but I think that's like why you could see from like a psycho psychologist's perspective, maybe from a secular humanist psychologist's perspective, where they would look at that and just say, well, you could have heaven now. And so maybe these texts are just metaphorical in nature in the sense that they're trying to ask you to strive to live the best life now because you can achieve all of this now versus I think Christianity is powerful in that it's so supernatural in the way that it's describing some of it that it's like, no, it doesn't matter how well you do life here on earth. This realm will never, ever compare to that one. Eyes have not seen, neither ear has heard, you know, what, what's in store for those that serve him. There's something in a, the God, you know, he is, he, his thoughts are different than our thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. Therefore, we should expect that on the other side is something that we really can't even explain here. We just can give nuances of what it will be like well on the and other to, side and to my example you know i said the 2d man tries to describe the 3d world it there there's going to be some parts of that where the 2d man can make sense of it but it's still there there's these other dimensions to the 3d man's world that expand those two dimensions past how the 2d man understands them even so it's kind of like you have length and width, but then when you add that depth, it's like, okay, now there's a whole new range of things we can do with length and width. And so I think ultimately where Christianity is, is unique in its manner of explaining this is that it says there are some aspects of this that you can kind of understand, which is it's a realm comprised of light, peace, love, God's there and, 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 and so you can see some of these like familiar, oh, interesting. Like that lines that, that lines up, that lines up. But then you start to read some of these accounts of heaven and you're like, this seems like a totally different place. Whereas when you read the texts and the description of the afterlife and a lot of these other world views and these other religions, 
you come to this conclusion that it seems as almost as if a man sat down in front of a page and said, let me dream up the best life I could possibly have on earth. And then that's what heaven's going to be, but all the time. And, and that's frankly just the way it reads and the way it feels because there is no transcendent quality to those texts. Whereas in, within Christianity, like you mentioned, there's, there's tons of texts in the Christianity tradition that's like, no eye has seen nor ear has heard what the Lord has prepared for, for those who love him. And, and that to me is like, bing, bing, bing. Like there's your answer of Christianity coming in and saying, look, some of this you're going to get some of this. None of us are going to get because God's making it. And so it's like, Yet when we go to these other religions, it's just like, oh, this is what paradise is going to be. And here are the attributes it's going to have. And this is how it's going to work. And it's just, they seem very detailed in the way that they account it, but it seems inaccurate. <laughs> All those details they give versus Christianity with the details it does give are all very accurate. I wouldn't put all religions in the same category of the detailing. I, I think if you look at... Uh, uh, if you look at Hindus, for example, or a lot of Buddhists, Buddhism, of course, came out of Hinduism uh, a long, long time ago. But the um, but their concept is is it it's almost vaguer than the Christian concept, mm. rather than more literal, and yet it's different again from NDEs. It would seem because okay, if if you're going to be reincarnated as another person or an animal or something else in the future why are we going to the other side and seeing deceased relatives who have been deceased for decades well maybe the reincarnation happens after a long period on the other side i don't know there are ways that you could try to harmonize this but but there really is if you get into uh, buddhism particularly there is no real i a me that's consistent through time we as humans here on earth are changing continually. I'm not the same as I was 10 years ago. And they'll say, okay, when you die and go to the other side, it's not you that's being, that's going to appear on the earth in this next life. You're really a different person. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you become a different person or you become a different animal. And this continues to change through the years. And it's not going to be you yourself with your personality in an eventual paradise if, if you make it to be uh you're going to become one with the universe one with this on all-encompassing mind the you will tend to disappear right uh and so with that view in mind it's really interesting that in a near-death experience you're seeing you're very much present on the other side experiencing this otherworldly atmosphere and yet it's a very real atmosphere with very real individuals who are very really talking to one another and communicating to one another rather than some kind of a um some kind of a bliss on the other side where yourself disappears so again this otherworldly experience maybe you're saying listen to me when i say this are you saying the significance of this otherworldly experience in the near-death experience is that number one this differentiates this experience from dreams and hallucinations which seem to pull from our prior memories and i don't wake up from a dream saying oh wow i can't even express it i can't express it my dreams are kind of weird but they're built upon experiences that I've had. So it different, this other willingness differentiates near-death experiences from dreams and hallucinations, but it also shows us, hey, if this were dreams and hallucinations, why would there be any consistency to them at all? And yet this other side is very consistent. You're seeing deceased relatives. You're seeing angelic figures. You're seeing God. You're seeing great beauty on the other side. There's a consistency. Why the consistency if this is just a naturalistic, um, something caused by naturalism? And finally, you're saying this does seem to distinguish the Christian view of the afterlife or the other side or the interim period, whatever you want to call it, 
from a lot of other worldviews which seem less consistent with what they're seeing in near-death experiences. So are those the three main things you're trying to bring out in this otherworldly experience? Yes. Yes, I would say that those are three major pieces that I am trying to, to walk out. I'd almost want to say the fourth one is, you know, as we kind of talk about it, it's helping me kind of further hone in on it, which is that Christianity, you know, you mentioned that it's like one end of the spectrum is super specific. And then one end of the spectrum, the other end of that same spectrum would be incredibly vague. And I think that it's like, like Nirvana, you're going yeah, to yeah, this yeah. Nirvana right. experience, right? And so what I'm saying is, is that Christianity seems to be nicely tucked into the middle here where it's like, it gives enough detail to tell you, here's a general idea of what to expect. And we can build some pretty robust ideas about what heaven is like but it's not so specific that you would go there and be incredibly disappointed because the 40 virgins or something wasn't there that there wasn't constantly bountiful feasts or um you know i'm looking at some of my my lists here of uh islam says with rivers of milk honey wine and pure water for the faithful um the bridge, a bridge thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword that every person must cross on ju judgment day to enter paradise. Again, maybe they could make their, maybe they could make the uh, argument that that's like a second uh, judgment, similar to Christian um, theology. Um, but it's like the righteous will cross safely while the wicked will fall into hell. It's, that seems oddly specific the scale the deeds will be weighed on a scale to determine to determine one's fate in the afterlife we don't see the the misian scale um uh the the grave barzika the transitional state between death and the day of judgment where the soul waits and may experience comfort or suffering maybe that's what they're gonna say is that this is like a this is like barzika or, or i don't know how they would pronounce it but again the, these details seem oddly not necessarily aligning with um, what we get out of these experiences. And so it's like Christianity uniquely positions itself in its description of that place. And, and for those who haven't heard me make this illustration before, I'll make it again now, which is, you know, what we're doing here is Glove is attempting to build a map. Okay, Glove is detailing out a map for us. And then what we do with, with the Glove when we're done is we look at the map that Glove has given us, and then we go look at the other maps. And the maps are Christianity, Islam, um, Hinduism, Buddhism. And then we start putting the map over top these other maps. And we say, which map does this most closely reflect as, as the accurate map? And I'm telling you that as we st stack these up, you'll find that when you lay this map over all other worldviews apart from Christianity, you're like, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. And then you get to Christianity, you lay the map down, and you go, that's it. Because of this and this and this and this and this and and granted this is up to the point you know maybe you're like why are we taking this serious at all it's like well again because we've established that near-death experiences are a, are a good form of evidence to be considered now where do we go from there and and kind of yes we're getting a little more in the weeds with it for sure but we're building we're building upon those things so does that make sense steve that makes sense to me. I'm I'm feeling I don't look at the otherworldly experience of near death experiences and say, "Oh my goodness, this is this is not what I would have expected with Christianity at all." You know, I, I, when I look at it, I say well, that sounds consistent with with Christianity to me, and so I, I think it's a very good fit. So so if we're looking for a worldview. Uh, and, and maybe all you know about spiritual things is near-death experiences, I would definitely look into Christian theology and read the Bible and see if you see, as Charlie and I do, that it, that it sounds like a snug fit. Because basically what we're doing is we're taking all the experiences of life, we're taking all these multiple lines of evidence that we see out there and saying what, what worldview and wh which religions fit best within the data that we have. And I think that's what we're doing when we're seeking. And if we seek, we'll ultimately find according to Jesus. So we're just seeking the truth, looking for what makes the most sense in the light of the data we have. And as far as ineffability, I don't want to get too wooey wooey about it. In other words, you can't, you can't explain any of it. No, no, no. 
it's really a combination of things that you can talk about and things that you can't fully explain. Mm -hmm. When people say they saw relatives on the other side, they, I believe, they believe that they actually saw deceased relatives on the other side. Now, that much is very specific. Now, as to how they communicated with each other mind to mind, they may say, I can't even explain that. But we that's what we were doing. That's how we were communicating. And and that is a, a big part of near-death experiences. That's a part of the, the core. Often, typically, probably, you see people communicating like that. And, um, and, and, and the specifics of seeing colors that you've never seen before. Uh, well, but they are talking about colors. It's just that going beyond understanding that they saw colors and great beauty, they, they have to let you know, but it was even beyond what I can explain, rather than saying it's just some kind of woo-woo that I can't really tell you anything about the experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny, you know, as we talk about it, it feels the conversation begins to feel ineffable if you go too far into it, which is the, the kind of irony, because I find myself struggling to kind of articulate it as, as much as I want to. Um, and I'll give you another specific from near death experiences. Sometimes sometimes a specific instance is better than 50 generalities. But when you're talking about it, uh, time, the difference in time. People will go to the other side and often when there's, they, they will say, I saw my whole life go mm -hmm. before my eyes, my mm -hmm. whole life. And yet they were only experiencing clinical death for a period of five minutes yeah, or minutes. two minutes. Mm -hmm. So somehow on the other side, it was like a lifetime almost there. They, they went through every aspect of their lives. Now that's very specific. What yeah. were they doing? They were reliving their lives. They were seeing things that they had said and done from the perspective, not only their own perspective, but the perspective of those they impacted with their things that they said and the things they did. And they went, some would say, I went through this whole thing in a period of a minute. Well, sure, so right. it's perfectly understandable what they did. They have no doubt that they reviewed their lives, maybe before Jesus, maybe before God, maybe with an angel looking at it. Those things are very specific. The ineffable part is I can't explain to you how I saw all this seemingly at one time, but I saw my whole life. Where was time? That I can't explain because we can only think in terms of time. Mm. Yeah, that's a great that's a great example, great practical example. And we'll talk more about life reviews once we get to the E of uh, ethical transformation, and because uh, that that's going to be a part of that is life reviews. So. Um, but, but that's a great example Steve just gave you guys, which is a perfect time is suspended because imagine how much time it would take to go through someone's entire life. Right. And, and kind of review the, tri even the trivial actions of you said this and that happened, you know, imagine that and, and these, the, you get a two hour film and it jumps over 99% of a person's life trying to, trying to detail out kind of the major events. So you can imagine, right? And so that's a great example of how time itself seems to be utterly suspended because they go through that and then they come back and they go, I felt like I was over there for such a long time and now I'm back here and you're telling me I was gone five minutes. So, and it's also interesting to me, and, and this is just a footnote of like, it's interesting to me that they would even notice time at all. You know, I, I there's definitely instances where like maybe I'm having a good, maybe I'm having a good time out and about, you know, somewhere. And it's just like, I'm not really noticing, Oh man, five hours went by. Right. I didn't even, I didn't even realize it is interesting to me that they would even get on the other side. And with everything that's happening and going on, they'd go, it feels like time itself is not a thing. And so I'm like, who's paying attention to that? You know? Um, so I just, I just always thought well, that was, I, I would, I would suspect that a lot of those things are not really realized until you get back here into time. And then you start reflecting back and say, wait a minute, how in the world did I experience all those years of things in a period of a couple of minutes? Yeah. I think that when the aspect of timelessness may dawn upon you is not while you're on the other side, but here, but, I, but I'm just thinking out loud here. I'd have to think back about the actual experiences, whether people said, and while I was over there, the first thing I noticed was, where's time? Because hmm. I can't imagine. 
I see time as a succession of events. If a succession of events is happening, it seems to me time's got to be there. I yeah. can't even imagine. It's beyond my imagination. Yeah. But either while they're there or once they get back, they're aware. Time was different over there, if we, it was there at all. We don't have the words for it, Steve. That's just what it is. <laughs> it's what it is. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen. But, but this stuff's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> And thanks yeah. for putting it together in a glove so that we can look at these factors and say which worldviews seem to fit best with it. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that'll conclude for today's episode. Next week, we'll be diving into the vividness, um, and we're going to have a lot more particular granular data we can get into on that one. So look forward to that one, um, and we'll continue our glove series, kind of wrapping it up once we're done with GLOVE. We'll do a final wrap-up. and. Uh, Help you guys kind of get the whole thing down. and uh, But in the meantime, we'll see you guys next week. God bless. And uh, thanks for tuning into this episode. If you disagree or if you know someone, uh, maybe you know like a Muslim apologist or something like that that would love to talk with us, we would be more than open to that. Um, comment below or send me a DM or something like that. We'll see if we can't set something up to where we can kind of chop it up with somebody like that and um, kind of go back and forth. But uh, in the meantime, God bless. And we'll see you guys in the next one.